Thank you for the invitation to present in this course on AI Ethics Global Perspectives. I'm Rafael Calvo, Chair of Engineering Design at the Dyson School of Design Engineering, Imperial College London. I'm also Imperial College co-lead at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence and co-editor of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. My research focuses on the design of intelligent systems that support well-being uh, in areas of mental health, medicine, and education, often applying techniques in machine learning, natural language processing, and data analytics. This has led me to publish about four books and about 200 uh, papers on these topics. Now, I would like to start this talk by saying that in many ways we have been here before. It's not all new. Engineers have built systems that follow the values of the time. For example, in the 19th and 19th centuries, engineers drove the first industrial revolution. This included exciting new materials, new forms of energy, and new technologies to increase productivity. These were the factories, steam engines and trains, rushing industry and people's lives into new frontiers. England was at the heart of this industrial revolution, taking the reins with deep Victorian values. At the cusp of this revolution, Prince Albert organized the Great Exhibition of 1851, a crystal palace an engineer wonder constructed entirely of glass and iron rose from the ground by industrial magic. Visitors came from all over the world, including Charles Dickens, Lewis Carroll and Charles Darwin, to experience this industrial miracle. It was such a success that its revenues funded Albertopolis, and today Albertopolis is known as Exhibition Road picture here in modern-day London. The vision for Albertopolis was to celebrate and drive the advancement of industry in the UK. Today it is the home of Imperial College London, Royal College of Arts, the Victoria and Albert Museum, world-leading institutions in design and engineering. But of course, there is much more to this success story. Taking a closer look, we find there are impacts on humans and society that aren't quite so worthy. There are children working in these factories. Workers are exploited, live in crowded, unsanitary conditions, and disease is rampant. The air is filled with smoke and the water with waste. Here in London, in 1850, we see Death himself rowing through a toxic river Thames. My family is from Argentina, where many of its trains are literally the same than those that were installed by the English in the late 1800s. The, these trains allowed resources like cows and cereals to get from Argentina and Latin America to Europe. But the impact on its indigenous people and on the environment are still noticeable. What values were driving a technological progress that could overlook such massive costs? And what things could have been done differently? Well, during the first Industrial Revolution, our values were centered on improving the economy, on expanding commerce and building the English Empire. This meant productivity and speed were the heroes of the day. Engineers were expected to target this. The steam engines, electricity, trains, planes, cars, required that we take natural resources out from the land, including water and air, and use them to feed the economy. In addition, to the consumption of these resources, our products produce waste when we make them, when we use them, and when we dispose of them. One way to address this is to minimize the flow of resources from the natural environment 
This is what we call the circular economy. Waste fed, it gets fed back into industry. This change in thinking from a framework in which we rely on infinite depletion of pollution of what are actually finite resources to a framework in which the ideal innovation creates no waste it can't reuse reflects a major change in values. More of us now value our land, our water and air. We want innovations that take into account the environment and reduce its destruction. Change in values led to change in policy in the 1960s and 70s, and we now have regulation and professional processes to help ensure industry cannot go on ignoring environmental cost in this drive to commercial gain. Environmental impact assessments are now a standard practice in many types of engineering. It requires all stakeholders, all stakeholders to come together and agree on what impact is acceptable and how it can be minimized. Well, these are at least the ideals. The extent to which this has been successful or hasn't been can be felt in rising temperatures, weather catastrophes, deadly pollution. We continue to breathe in increased rates of asthma and lung diseases in our poorest have no cleaning drinking water. Although values have changed, much more needs to be done. But the first industrial revolution is now old news. Today, you're living in the midst of a new revolution. And that's what we're discussing today here. Big data, small data, the data about our lives and our behavior is so, lac so lucrative that it now often is called the new oil. This makes companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon the new oil companies. This is a significant change in the way we envision society, technology, and the economy. For many of today's technologies, satisfying a human need is not the end goal, but only a means to an end. Facebook doesn't provide free social networking services to help the world. It does so to make revenue. Meeting a human need for connectivity is only valuable insofar as it produces profit. And profit comes from the data it generates and the attention it extracts and sells to advertisers. So what I want to talk today about is an approach to responsible engineering, design and innovation of systems, uh, including AI. And we propose a human impact assessment for technology uh, this year. I believe we can, and we can describe um, a human impact assessment for technology that we call Hyatt, that predicts and evaluates the impact that new digital technologies have on all stakeholders. Uh, this will acknowledge that these systems have psychosocial impacts on individuals and society, and that some of these may be negative for health, well-being, and values. Things like privacy, autonomy, and even democracy. We discuss what we can uh, learn from these impact assessments in other fields, how to tap into existing ethical frameworks for AI, and the unique challenges associated with assessing impact on humans and society. Because, of course, there are many differences between the environmental impact um, that we were talking first and this new one that has to do with AI and data. The environmental impact assessment of a factory is generally slow or static once installed. It has boundaries, it's regional. It happens where that factory or that bridge is created. It's largely anticipatory. We can predict the amount of pollution or noise that that factory will create. And it considers nature as the resource. Finally, we have a long history and that allows us to have research methods that we can use, measures that we, we trust. On the other hand, when we are talking about the human impact of AI, we have systems that are dynamic, that self-learn, that are unbounded. A system that I developed today in London will have an impact in Argentina, in Latin America, in Africa very soon after. It's continuous and iterative. It's very hard to predict because it keeps changing uh, 
in the way that users interact with it. Maybe most importantly is that humans are the resource. Like I said before, humans become a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And finally, it's a set of new technologies that we don't yet know, understand well enough, so we don't have measures that people will generally trust. As we create technologies that promise to improve people's lives, engineers need to make similar ethical commitments to those that health professionals make with their patients. And that's one of the cases I want to make in this talk. This includes supporting well-being, making sure they do no harm, supporting human autonomy, and being fair and just. Imagine what happens when doctors, hospitals, or others involved with your health are motivated only by profit. When you don't have an NHS or national health system, you need to be very careful about the way that business models affect the health of nations. And that is why we now have this biomedical ethics framework that all in the industry must abide to. That is why we also have a strong regulatory framework that limits how products are designed, manufactured, commercialized, and advertised, um, you know, medical products. Our team has focused on psychological well-being as a key value because we believe it's at the core of human experience with technology. This wish to be well is common to all sentient beings. But an evidence-based approach means we must define and understand well-being using the best tools and knowledge available. In our book, Positive Computing, we review methods from psychology, neuroscience and economics on what are the determinant factors of well-being and how they can be supported through technology design. Of these models, we have found one of the most effective within the technology context is self-determination theory that identifies autonomy, competence, and relatedness as the pillars of well-being or optimal functioning. Satisfaction of these psychological needs also predicts user satisfaction, engagement, and motivation, making this theory especially applicable to technology experience. And it has like 40 years of empirical evidence from different cultures, different age groups, different business domains, from workplaces to education to health and so forth. Competence here is about feeling capable and effective. In technology, this is very connected to our measures of usability and learnability. Autonomy is about our sense of willingness and endorsement of actions and behaviors. It is not really about being independent. It is about endorsement and an alignment with our values. Finally, relatedness refers to the feeling of being part of a community or having meaningful relationships with others. But the psychological needs by themselves are not enough. We have identified the need to be much more specific about where this need satisfaction occurs, which, which led us to develop these seed fears of technology experience, four of which, the yellow ones, break down the user experience as we know it. The first sphere, adoption, refers to the decision-making experience between becoming aware of a new technology and acquiring it. Here we ask questions like, to what extent is adoption of the technology autonomously motivated? Or to what extent does a potential user expect that technology will help them meet their need for competence or relatedness? Then we move into the yellow spheres, which encapsulate what designers call the user experience. At the lowest granularity, this includes the interface, which describes the experience of interacting with the technology via its controls, navigation, uh, uh, and functions during use. The quick questions to ask here are, to what extent does direct interaction with the technology, 
via the, the user interface, support need satisfaction. And this mediates good usability scores and user satisfaction. A step up, we look at the task level or how need satisfying are the small tasks the technology supports. For example, in a fitness app, a task might be counting steps. How need satisfying is it to track your steps? Does it make you feel more or less competent? Can changes to how the task support is designed impact on this? Tasks generally combine to make a larger activity or a behavior, for example, exercising. So the question here is, to what extent does the technology improve need satisfaction with respect to exercise, which is the behavior that technology is designed to support? Here, need satisfaction should mediate engagement with the behavior, with the exercise in this case. In other domains, uh, will, it will be mediating other behavior, specific outcomes like health outcomes, learning outcomes, etc. And for the final sphere within this user experience, we have life. The life sphere looks at the individual overall experience, including everything beyond the technology. Many technologies will not uh, be expected to have an, uh, an impact on, on this, at this life level. An egg timer, for example, could be measured lower down the spheres, but we could hardly expect it to have a profound impact on well-being in life. But a mindfulness app, however, might. Certainly, any technology that is keen to show it does not cause harm, for example, through indirect effects or high levels of addiction, should be willing to measure at the live level. Because that is where sometimes the only place certain harms will be revealed. An easy target example will be a technology that is highly addictive will be highly need satisfying at the interface and tasks levels, and th that's why we are engaged. But if, we, if overuse, it will begin to undermine autonomy and relatedness at the life level, uh, as relationships, for example, and values uh, are impacted. Finally, we go beyond the user experience into the society sphere. This fear includes direct and indirect impact on family, friends, and the non-users across society. While the idea of considering at this level is very, very daunting for many technology makers, engineers, even myself, there is an increasing pressure to do so with more people concerned about technology ethics and more people working on ways to make this possible, as all of you listening to this course. Now I want to go a little bit more into the process. Uh, these spheres can help us tease apart the effects uh, that, of technologies that are supporting psychological needs. Uh, in the methods paper, there is more detail about the use of SET across the different spheres and on possible measures. Uh, but the process uh, that we have also proposed brings these into a design approach that is common. And we have proposed a process for this responsible engineering, design and innovation of AI technologies um, that uses the double diamond uh, design method um, that is very popular amongst design engineers and designers more generally. Uh, but it adds to this double diamond the considerations on its impact on well-being and more generally on, on ethics. This happens when we are developing insights about the problem. When we, that's here, when we um, ideate possible solutions and when we evaluate the outcomes, you know, both in prototypes and then in a final deployment. Again, you can find more details about this approach in this paper here. But of course, there are differences between AI and many other technology ethics problems. One of them is that because it requires such amounts of data and infrastructure, we feel the pressure to reuse its algorithms as much as possible. 
For many years, I was professor of software engineering and reusability practice are at the core of our discipline. But when this happens, we put a significant focus on infrastructure. And, but then the, the, the thing is that the infrastructure gets used in many what we call vertical markets or application domains. And a classification algorithm that we consider ethical when used, let's say, in medicine might not be considered ethical in military applications. The same computer vision technique might be understood to be about safety in one situation and about government control in another. But even when within the same industry, the way one company uses the algorithm might be considered appropriate, but the way it is used in another is not. In one, it has a positive impact, and in another, it might have a negative one. So which one do we regulate? Which one do we assess for impact? Many of the concerns we have today on AI ethics are conceived with this implicit understanding of hierarchy between core technologies or infrastructure, specific markets and clients. When we think about AI ethics, we often think of the AI infrastructure, the platforms that implement the algorithms that make, let's say, computer vision or natural language processing possible. For example, we ask these frameworks to be explainable. One key difference with environmental impact assessment is that the cost of the infrastructure for AI system is much higher proportionally than that for the industrial projects. Of course, we spend money in thinking how to create bridges, but most of the money goes into actually creating it, creating each specific bridge or each specific factory. Occasionally, we think about the general application domain. For example, if we use uh, a neural network for face recognition, insecurity is not okay. But if we apply the same mathematical technique to detecting a tumor, it is okay. I think the impact of technology can only be understood when someone interacts with it. The meaning of AI is only realized when it is put in a specific technology, in a specific context, a specific place where certain people use it. This is the core of the interactionist approach, no? Uh, interactional technology ethics uh, conception. Of course, the three levels are important, infrastructure, market, and client deployment. But the last one, is one we often forget. Again, this is an important question to understand which one we should regulate and assess the impact. So I'm going to use some two case studies uh, that hopefully help you understand my views on this more, more clearly. As mentioned before, the spheres can help us tease apart effects of technologies that are supporting psychological needs at one level while undermining them at another. We can use this to assess the impact when we assess the impact on life uh, in, long, in longer studies. One of the projects we, we worked on was Headgear. The Headgear project aimed at improving the mental health in the board workplaces. Uh, it was funded by the Movember Foundation and in partnership with ambulance, fire, and police services. These were male-dominated industries. We ran workshops asking people about the problems they had. The designer then produced designs to support what we understood were users' values. We also understood the power relations between staff and employees. And the software architect they saw, uh, we looked for trusted distribution channels that were trusted. Of course, we also asked mental health researchers and we incorporated the best clinical practices into design. All our projects follow this participatory approach to design and I think this is critical for bringing ethics into software development and AI systems. The evidence is that such approaches are much more likely to lead 
to engage in products. So it's good business. But also, I have over time become more aware of how they can also help us build products that promote health and are more ethical. In this case, we ran a randomized control trial <clears throat> that showed that it didn't have a negative impact that, and it did support well-being. It showed that the technology had a positive effect. It reduced the risk of depression and anxiety on the treatment group versus the control group. Of course, randomized controlled trials are not the solution to every problem. It, it works in health and some other domains, but in non every type of innovation. So my second example is in a way more complicated and refers to understanding the impact on a wider group of stakeholders. And I want to bring here the importance of paying attention to the wider group of stakeholders. This was a project with Reach Out Australia, an organization that helps 1.8 million users, young people <coughs> that are going through tough times. And one of the functionalities they have is a, <coughs> a peer support group where young people can go and ask questions about relationships or substance abuse or the sort of problems that young people have. And one of the, 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 the things that they have is a group of moderators that help respond and manage this online community. So we wanted to build a set of tools that help provide a better service to, to the young people going through tough times. And this was moderator assistant. So we use natural language processing techniques to process the input and then we use natural language generation techniques to generate template answers. So somebody will say, hello everyone, I have been feeling awful for over four weeks. So my GP gave me Soloft, has anyone used it? Uh, can you tell me about it? Um, so this is a, a mental health question. The system will diagnose this, it could be depression because a person is taking antidepressant this will go into a classifier and the, when the classifier says uh, provides a diagnostic we generated um, feedback questions related to that diagnostic and any information that we might have about this particular user so we run a pilot well we had a, a very detailed diagnostic manual and that we use to, to train the algorithms and generate a data set that then we use to train the algorithm. Uh, and for the responses, uh, we also ran a trial and technically the system was very successful. The accuracy of the diagnosing algorithm was much better than the baseline. We then ran a pilot with 44 psychology students and they automatically generated tests were thought to have been written by humans, written by humans by about 80% of the psychology students. Although the aim of this natural language generation was not to replace the human moderator, the system could potentially be very useful for providing moderators with draft responses, which basically will reduce their workload. And even if those responses require editing, um, we thought it would be, benefi it, it would be beneficial to, to the moderators because it will allow them to increase, uh, to add, deal with increased demand for, for feedback. But while these measures the system were satisfactory, one and a half years into the project, we realized that the project had failed and we had to basically restart from scratch. Although the automation had gone as planned, as we were uh, doing or getting ready for the deployment, the industry partner came back uh, and said he had to pull off, uh, the system was putting off the moderators. Moderators were not going to engage and use it. So when we investigated with the moderators, we understood that they felt a loss of autonomy in the interaction. They perceived 
a long-term loss of competences. They felt like a cog in a machine. And very wisely, I think the managers pulled the plug and we had to go to the back to the drawing board. So we created a new version of the system, uh, triage, we called it, that listens to every new post as it comes in and then makes a decision about how urgently it needs moderator attention. Not a diagnosis, but a priorities that helps the moderator decide what to spend the time on. It's green if the post doesn't contain anything concerning, orange if it should be addressed at some point, red if it should be addressed as soon as they can, and we also then added the super red category uh, where uh, if the, the user is talking about suicide or self-harm or so harming someone else. Reach out um, found this triage super useful. It actually helped, we added features to help moderators connect to each other, to highlight the competences they had, the skills. So for example, if an incoming post was about substance abuse and one of the moderators, many of which had lived experiences, had experiences on substance abuse, he, uh, somebody might recommend him uh, to respond to the, and the user. So it was helping moderators be better moderators rather than replacing some of the tasks. The technical results were again fantastic. When deployed, the system improved the process in all the key measures. Uh, it had 84% 84, 84 accuracy. The time to respond that maybe was the most important was reduced by 80% for crisis post. And this is the most critical one because they talk about suicide, so you need to respond very quickly. And maybe most importantly, the moderators have been engaged with the system for about four years now. In summary, I think AI ethics is technology ethics. Technologies mediate our experiences of the outside world. Our schools, our health systems, our workplaces, they mediate how we make decisions. But the meaning of the technology can only become evident during our interaction with it. It cannot be understood by itself. AI can seem sometimes successful in some measures, but then have a negative impact in others. Exploring then all stakeholders and their values during the design phase is important. Regulation or just evaluation of the infrastructure is not enough. Actual deployments need to be assessed. Thank you very much.